Hi, let's start a new chapter, Leasing. In this video, we shall discuss the concept of leasing, the differences between a lease and higher purchase, the types of leasing, the advantages and disadvantages of leasing, cross-border leasing, and the regulatory aspects of leasing. Leasing refers to the use of a physical asset, especially equipment or capital goods, in return for a periodical payment. A lease contract usually involves two principal parties, the lessor and the lessee. Lessor is the actual owner of the asset, who permits the use of the asset in return for a periodical payment. Lessee is the party who acquires the right to use the asset by paying the periodical amount. A lease and a higher purchase transaction are almost similar to each other. However, there is a small difference between these two with respect to the legal structure. In a higher purchase transaction, the party which uses the asset is the legal owner of the asset. Therefore, the user of the asset will claim the depreciation. However, the full title is passed only after all the agreed installments are paid. Now coming to the lease transaction, the user of the asset, who is known as the lessee, is not the legal owner of the asset and therefore cannot show the asset in his balance sheet. Such leased assets are known as off-balance sheet assets for the lessee and therefore he cannot claim depreciation. Whereas the lessor, who is the legal owner of the asset, can claim the depreciation. So those are the basic differences between a higher purchase transaction and a lease transaction. But please note one point, there are different types of leases. So the legal structure of each type of lease could be different, remember that. Now let's take a look at the different types of leases. The leases can be broadly categorized into operating lease, financial lease, sale and lease back, and sales aid lease. You must have learnt about the operating lease and the finance lease in the accounting standards. Anyway, an operating lease is what is considered as the true form of lease. Whenever someone mentions a lease, by default, we immediately think about the operating lease, whereas a finance lease is actually a lending transaction, which is disguised as a lease for legal or tax purposes. In a finance lease, the lesser is the legal owner of the asset. But from the perspective of economic interest, it is the lessee who is considered as the owner. Now let's take a quick look at the differences between an operating lease and a finance lease. An operating lease is usually for a short period of time, whereas a finance lease is for a longer period of time and it usually lasts almost the entire economic life of the asset. In an operating lease, the lesser will not be able to recover the full cost of the asset during the lease period, whereas in a finance lease, the lesser should be able to recover the full cost of the asset after adjusting the scrap value, other incidental charges and the financing cost. In an operating lease, the lesser incurs the repairs and maintenance cost, whereas in a finance lease, the lessee incurs these costs. In an operating lease, the depreciation on the asset is claimed by the lesser, whereas in case of a finance lease, it is usually claimed by the lessee. In an operating lease, the asset is transferred back to the lesser after the end of the lease term. Whereas in case of a finance lease, the lessee is usually given the option to purchase the asset at a nominal cost at the end of the lease term. In an operating lease, the lessor bears the incidental risk of the asset, whereas in a finance lease, the lessee bears that risk. So those are the differences between an operating lease and a finance lease. A leveraged lease is not a separate type of lease. 
it is just a variation of the finance lease. In a leverage lease, there are three parties, that is the lender, the lesser and the lessee. The lender finances a major part of the asset cost, usually up to 70 to 90 percent of the asset cost. And the lesser finances the remaining part. So the lesser is considered as the equity participant. In a leverage lease transaction, the lesser leases the asset to the lessee and in turn the lessee pays the lease rentals to the lesser and then the lesser pays back the principal along with the interest to the lender in the form of installments. Let's say you have one large equipment and you are in urgent need of some cash. So what you can do is, you can hypothecate this equipment and get a loan. But a problem with this transaction is, the loan that you took will appear in your balance sheet as a liability and it affects your debt equity ratio. To overcome this problem, the concept of sale and leaseback has been introduced. In a sale and leaseback transaction, the equipment is first sold to another party and immediately the equipment is taken back on a lease. The party who bought the equipment is the lesser, while the party who sold the equipment and took it back on lease is the lessee. What is the relationship between cab drivers and Uber? If you have a car and if you know how to drive a car, then you can register with Uber and start working for them. This way you can earn some money. But what if you don't have a car? Don't worry, Uber will take care of it. But how? If you don't have a car, Uber will give you a car on lease and all you have to do is pay the lease rental every month. That's it. Now let's look at this transaction from a car manufacturer's perspective. For example, from Maruti Suzuki's perspective. Suzuki would like to enter into an agreement with Uber so that Uber will buy the cars from Suzuki and lease them out to the cab drivers. This agreement is beneficial to Suzuki because its car sales will increase without incurring any additional marketing cost or paying dealer's commission. And of course, as Suzuki gets all these benefits, it will offer the cars to Uber at lower than the market price. So it's a win-win situation for everyone involved. This type of a lease transaction is known as sales aid lease, where the lesser and the seller or the manufacturer have a predefined agreement. So that was the discussion on types of leasing. Now let's move on to the advantages and disadvantages of leasing. The first advantage is flexibility. The lease agreement can be drafted or modified as per the specific requirements of both the parties involved. Number two, no initial payment. There's no need to pay any down payment. On the contrary, a financing plan requires a minimum down payment. Number three, quicker appraisal and less time consuming process, especially compared to the traditional financing methods. Number four, leased equipment is an off balance sheet item and therefore it does not affect the debt position or the debt equity ratio of the lessee. Hence, it does not affect the future borrowing capacity of the lessee. Number six, with short term leasing, that is with operating leasing, the lessee need not worry about obsolescence or asset maintenance. Number seven, tax benefits. The tax benefits depend on the tax status of the lesser and lessee. And lastly, banks or financial institutions may not accept small equipment as collateral to provide the finance or loans. In such cases, leasing could be the only option. The first disadvantage of leasing is 
the lease rentals should be paid right from the beginning. The moratorium period is usually not available for leasing. Therefore, leasing is not suitable for projects with long gestation periods. Certain equipment manufacturers and sellers provide warranty only to the owner of the asset, that is, to the lesser. The warranty may not be applicable if the asset is used by the others, including the lessee. The third disadvantage is, the asset could be seized by the lender if the lesser doesn't repay the loan on equipment. So ultimately, the lessee will suffer due to the lessor's default. And finally, the implied financing cost of leasing is usually higher than the interest cost of a regular term loan. Even after considering all these demerits, leasing is still very popular, mainly because of the flexibility it offers to the parties involved. Cross-border leasing refers to a leasing arrangement in which the lesser and the lessee are located in two different countries. Cross-border lease transactions are generally used for infrastructure projects such as rail transportation equipment, power generation systems, telecommunication equipment, etc. The airlines industry also frequently resorts to cross-border leasing instead of purchasing the aeroplanes outright. Cross-border leasing is very popular in European countries and it is gaining traction elsewhere also. Cross-border leasing has become a good alternative for the traditional forms of export financing of capital goods. But what is the reason for this rising popularity of the cross-border leasing transactions? Actually, there are several reasons for its popularity. Let's look at each one of those reasons. First of all, the term owner of an asset could be defined in different ways in different countries. Some countries define the term owner from a strict legal perspective, whereas some countries define the term owner from an economic usage perspective. Therefore, in such situations, both the lesser and the lessee could be recognized as owners in their respective countries. And therefore, both of them could claim depreciation as an expenditure. Whereas in some cases, cross-border lease transactions are entered into to take advantage of the differences in the tax laws of various countries. Such arrangements are usually made in the form of sale and leaseback transactions. For example, let's say Mr. Tax Free is located in a country in which there are low taxes and Mr. High Tax is located in a country with high tax rates. So both Mr. Tax Free and Mr. High Tax can enter into an arrangement in which Mr. Tax Free will sell his own asset to Mr. High Tax. Now Mr. High Tax will immediately give the asset back to Mr. Tax Free on lease. This transaction is a sale and lease back transaction. Because of this transaction, Mr. High Tax who is now the owner of the asset, can claim depreciation as an expenditure. As he gets the benefit of tax shield on depreciation, he will pass on part of the benefit to Mr. Tax Free in the form of low lease rentals. So it's a win-win for both the parties. In such sale and leaseback transactions, in some cases, the lessee is made to pay all the lease rentals in advance. Of course, this lump sum amount will be adjusted for the time value of money. This lump sum amount of advance lease rentals will be deposited with a third party, usually with a bank or a financial institution, which in turn will make the periodic payments to the lessor. Making such an upfront payment in lieu of future payments is known as defeasance. The advantages of such defeasance or upfront payment are number one no forex risk to the lessee. As the entire amount is paid in advance, the amount is converted into forex only once. There's no need to convert the amount again and again. The second advantage is, the advance payment acts as a credit enhancement for the lessee. And finally, the lessee can negotiate better terms for himself and could thus earn some savings. So, these are some of the cross-border leasing arrangements. 
In addition to these, it is possible to have many more complex cross-border leasing arrangements in which multiple parties could get involved or in some cases even special purpose vehicles are created. So that was all about the topic cross-border leasing. Now let's move on to the next topic, regulatory aspects of leasing. A leasing company is a non-banking finance company. So whatever rules and regulations that apply to an NBFC will apply to a leasing company as well. As per RBI Act, every NBFC and therefore by extension every leasing company should be registered with RBA and it should have a minimum net owned fund of rupees 25 lakhs but not exceeding rupees 200 lakhs. Net owned fund is calculated as paid up capital plus free reserves minus accumulated losses minus deferred revenue expenditure minus other intangible assets minus investments made in the shares of subsidiaries, group companies and other NBFCs. And if you recollect in chapter 8 banking, I told you that some of the NBFCs are permitted to accept deposits while some NBFCs are not permitted to accept deposits. Equipment leasing companies fall into the category of NBFCs that are permitted to accept deposits. Please note that. So those are some of the basic concepts on leasing. In the upcoming video, we shall discuss how to evaluate the leasing options and we shall also solve a few numericals. Leasing refers to the use of a physical asset, especially equipment or capital goods in return for a periodical payment. A lease contract usually involves two principal parties the lessor and the lessee. In a higher purchase transaction, the party which uses the asset is the legal owner of the asset. Therefore, the user of the asset will claim the depreciation. However, the full title is passed only after all the agreed installments are paid. Now coming to the lease transaction, the user of the asset who is known as the lessee is not the legal owner of the asset and therefore cannot show the asset in his balance sheet. Such leased assets are known as off balance sheet assets for the lessee and therefore he cannot claim depreciation. Whereas the lessor who is the legal owner of the asset can claim the depreciation. The leases can be broadly categorized into operating lease, financial lease, sale and lease back and sales aid lease. An operating lease is a true form of leasing whereas a finance lease is actually a lending arrangement which is disguised as a lease. So normally an operating lease usually lasts for a relatively shorter period of time whereas a finance lease usually lasts for almost the entire economic life of the asset. In an operating lease the lesser incurs the maintenance and repair cost and he is allowed to claim depreciation as an expenditure. Whereas in a finance lease the lesser does not incur any maintenance cost or repair cost and he is not allowed to claim depreciation as his expenditure. A leverage lease is a type of finance lease in which there are three parties, the lesser, the lessee and the lender. The lesser who is also known as the equity participant invests only 10 to 30 percent on the asset whereas the rest 70 to 90 percent is held by the lender. In a sale and leaseback transaction, the equipment is first sold to another party and immediately 
the equipment is taken back on a lease. The party who bought the equipment is the lesser, while the party who sold the equipment and took it back on lease is the lessee. In a sales aid lease, the lesser and the equipment manufacturer or seller have a predefined agreement. The lesser will help the seller in marketing the product and in return the lesser will get the asset at lower price. The first advantage is flexibility. The lease agreement can be drafted or modified as per the specific requirements of both the parties involved. Number 2. No initial payment. There is no need to pay any down payment. On the contrary, a financing plan requires a minimum down payment. Number 3. Quicker appraisal and less time consuming process, especially compared to the traditional financing methods. Number 4. Leased equipment is an off balance sheet item and therefore it does not affect the debt position or the debt equity ratio of the lessee. Hence, it does not affect the future borrowing capacity of the lessee. Number 6. With short term leasing, that is, with operating leasing, the lessee need not worry about obsolescence or asset maintenance. Number 7. Tax benefits. The tax benefits depend on the tax status of the lesser and lessee. And lastly, banks or financial institutions may not accept small equipment as collateral to provide the finance or loans. In such cases, leasing could be the only option. The first disadvantage of leasing is, the lease rentals should be paid right from the beginning. The moratorium period is usually not available for leasing. Therefore, leasing is not suitable for projects with long gestation periods. Certain equipment manufacturers and sellers provide warranty only to the owner of the asset, that is, to the lesser. The warranty may not be applicable if the asset is used by the others, including the lessee. The third disadvantage is, the asset could be seized by the lender if the lesser doesn't repay the loan on equipment. So ultimately, the lessee will suffer due to the lessor's default. And finally, the implied financing cost of leasing is usually higher than the interest cost of a regular term loan. Cross-border leasing refers to a leasing arrangement in which the lesser and the lessee are located in two different countries. Cross-border leasing transactions are structured to take advantage of the differences in the two countries with respect to the legal definition of the term owner or the tax laws. Some of the cross-border leasing transactions are structured as sale and leaseback transactions. In such transactions, the lease rentals are usually paid in advance as a lump sum amount. Such advance payment of future obligations is known as deficience. A leasing company is a non-banking finance company. So, whatever rules and regulations that apply to an NBFC will apply to a leasing company as well. As per RBI Act, every NBFC and therefore by extension every leasing company should be registered with RBI and it should have a minimum net owned fund of rupees 25 lakhs but not exceeding rupees 200 lakhs. An equipment leasing company falls within the category of NBFCs which are permitted to accept the deposits.